If you've been coming all day um, to these panels, you've heard that Houston is much more than just energy, and we're very proud of energy and what's happening as we get moving um, around the clean energy projects. But you also heard over today about biotechnology, our healthcare systems, information technology, and aerospace. And um, this panel is going to talk with you about how we really address the workforce needs in our region and um, that, that diverse workforce and how we continue to recruit and do things differently than what we've done before. So I'm going to start and have the panel introduce themselves. We'll start with Stacy Putman. She is over um, leadership development and strategic projects at Enios, and she has been very involved with a lot of the work at Greater Houston Partnership, and then also just in the entire Houston region. So, Stacy, why don't you tell us about your company and about your job there? Thank you, Brenda. I've been glad to do so. And so nice to be here today. I appreciate uh, Greater Houston's partnerships invitation to be here at South By. It's been a great weather here. We're having terrible weather last weekend for spring break, so I'm glad to be here rather than in Galveston where I live. So I do have a pretty interesting um, role at Enios. Enios is a privately owned chemical company. We're located in 29 countries around the globe, and we make uh, a product that goes into many other end-use products that are used in uh, modern life today. My title is uh, Manager of Workforce and Leadership Development and Strategic Projects, as Dr. Hellyer said. And I've been in our industry for 42 years. And it's pretty amazing to get to work in one industry for that long. I've been with Enios for 22 years. And I get to work on projects now after that long of being in our industry that really have an impact on people's lives globally as well as locally. So I have a role working with the UN with observer status on the global treaty to end plastic waste. So we'll be in Ottawa in May. Uh, observing the negotiations and supporting the delegates. I'm on the U.S. delegation, and that is going to hopefully end up with a treaty later this year, and that will have a big impact in a lot of places around the world. And then locally, I uh, try to have an impact every single day on the lives of the workforce in our company as well as our future coworkers. That's how I look at all of you any children or grandchildren that you have. And I work closely with the K through 12 um, and higher ed institutions to help us understand at Enios the needs of the incoming workforce and also to ensure that the teachers, the counselors, and the faculty understand our business as well. So I am in the energy business. We do have a lot of jobs that are outdoor jobs, but at least 50% of our jobs are indoor jobs, and at least a third of our jobs in the chemical industry, you never have to take chemistry. So there's a, a way I want people to think about coming to work in our industry. Thank you, Stacy. And our next panelist is Raj Salhotra, and he is the executive director with Momentum Education. So tell us about your company, the organization, and who you're trying to serve. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hellyer. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, my name is Raj Salhotra, and I run Momentum Education. We're an educational nonprofit, and we focus on really achieving three main goals. The first is making sure our students get into college or community college or some post-secondary education. Number two, make sure they graduate from whatever post-secondary education they're pursuing. And then number three, ensure that they get a job after that. And we focus our support on first-generation, low-income students. These are students whose parents did not go to college and are often receiving uh, the Pell Grant um, to support them on their way to college. And we provide them with a myriad of services, including mentorship from professionals in their career field who can help them learn the skills to get into the workforce, helping them find internships to help them you know, get that experience that's just so critical before uh, getting a job. And then number three, that financial support, because we know that scholarships are essential because we don't want students sort of mired uh, in debt. And so we do all that. We've been around for about four years. We serve about 900 students now in high school and college with 48 alums uh, in college, and I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Raj. And then our, our next panelist is Ali um, Danziger. I always have to look and make sure I got that right um, location of my vowels there. And um, I start, first started working with you at Ampersand, 
and now you've sold the company to Ascent Funding. So why don't you tell us about what your company does? Sure, and I can start with Ampersand, but thank you guys so much. Uh, thrilled to be here today, and sorry about my voice. I'm on day seven of South by Southwest, and so I have completely lost my... I woke up yesterday with no voice, so I do apologize, but thrilled to be here, but sorry for the, the raspiness. Um, so in 2020, I started a company called Ampersand, and we are were a uh, wraparound support service and platform to help students thrive after graduation and bridge the education to employment skills gap. Um, the, I sold that company six months ago to a company called Ascent Funding. They're a student loan provider that's focused on not just helping students pay for college, but also helping students plan for that education and then succeed post-graduation. So they acquired my software platform and everything that came with it to ensure that they were really providing all students that work with them with the wraparound support that they need to thrive after school and into their career. So we know that as a lender, we're with students for sometimes 10 to 15 years, and we want to make sure that they're getting the support that they need to truly thrive. So what our platform does is um, there's tons, and we'll talk more about it, but tons of videos, um, scripts, templates, tools, checklists, all mobile friendly and mobile first um, in intentionally created for a Gen Z learner to really ensure that they have the tools they need right in their pocket um, to f achieve academic success, financial independence, and workplace readiness. Great. So that's the panel. And um, we're going to have about 45 minutes when we'll have a discussion and then the last 15 minutes um, for you to have questions. So, so make sure you get your questions ready. And in Houston, we have an unemployment rate that's right about 3.8%. And really, the challenge, I think, for employers is how do you find the employees you need? Because we're a growing um, city, a lot of growing populations or growing industries. And how do you find the employees that you need? And then how do you make sure that they have the skills that you need? And those skills we hear about so many times from our industry around the soft or employable skills. And we want to hear what those really are. But we also want to understand how does technology play into this? How does AI become part of that? So Stacy, why don't you tell us about what's happening at Enios and what you're doing to help recruit the right talent? Sure, and it is a challenge because it um, is, is evolving. And, and so when I have hiring managers I'm working with and they say, I need three people at this time and these are the skills and I need resumes in here that's appropriate uh, over the next two weeks, uh, you know, that, that, that gives us some challenges because how we describe the skills we need and how the skills are taught and how we translate can be really challenging um, for, for job seekers. Uh, what we are looking for predominantly uh, these days, because this could change in a year, but what we're, the way we describe it today is we need folks who are good collaborators and problem solvers. And a year ago, I, I described this uh, while working with San Jacinto College on a National Science Foundation project to talk about and think about what the technicians of the future needed. We used a little bit different language around how they communicate. So when we say collaborate today, what we mean is they're going to listen well and deeply. They're gonna respond and not react. They're going to bring their whole thought process to that problem solving. So the problem solving and the collaboration are tied together. Because of the advancements in technology and because uh, uh, people today in the workforce that are, that are trying to join the workforce, the technology has been around them all their life, they're going to be really great at accessing data, accessing information, and that's what we're going to expect. And we're going to ask them to be able to analyze that data for a decision maker. And we're going to even tell them, here's the level of decision making you can make. And they need to be comfortable with that accountability. So that is so important to us that the students, um, the folks in the workforce today that are training up to upskill, to, to come to work in our industry, that they're going to have that type of skill, that type of confidence, and that they're going to be able to work well in a team environment because we're going to get them to work in that team environment day one. And so that's really, truly what we're looking for, and that's what came out of that, that project we did. And all the companies involved across all the business segments were in that same space that we're in. And I've got this little flyer from... 
Texas Econ Dev that I picked up at the expo. And, and Brenda, you're exactly right. I mean, it, this says Texas is the leading destination for corporate relocation and expansion projects. So that unemployment rate with all the people moving here, we need to close that gap. We need to help those folks that are coming in that are riding the coattails of whoever took the job here. We can find a fit for them. Great. Ali Raj, jump in here. What You work with a lot of employers. What um, Stacy described, does it fit, or are you hearing something different? No, totally. So um, we focus on NACE, the National Association of Colleges and employers, they've identified eight core competencies that are key to success for early career professionals. And then they have outlined the discrepancies between what young professionals actually graduate knowing and their competency in those skills and what employers expect. Communications, number one, problem solving, um, actually understanding and taking responsibility and the growth mentality. So those four things are the main out of the eight that we focus on in our curriculum. There's also an organization called America Succeeds and they just two months ago put out a big wheel on I think 28 different durable skills is the terminology that they use versus soft skills or power skills, all the different terminology, but based basically the same things that you're seeing. So that's exactly what we've heard. We worked with probably 600 different employers at ampersand and heard the same thing over and over again. The, the content was all created in-house after working for 12 years um, in a market as leading a marketing agency and what are the skills that young professionals graduated either from high school, community college, or Harvard not knowing. They might have known how to write a press release or do a competitive analysis or do ba things that you learn in school, but they don't know how to send a calendar invite. They don't know how to show up to a meeting. They don't know how to ask their boss for vacation in the most appropriate way or work with their peers, which are different than their classmates. And so we are literally giving them like checklists and tools and scripts and templates of what they need to say when they walk into their boss's office to introduce themselves or when they want to ask for that time off or if they're advocating for a raise how to do it because no one's ever taught them uh, and there's just a huge gap there so it's important to have those skills but schools don't really have the time to teach it and employers are hiring hoping and expecting them to have those skills so organizations like mine i believe organizations like yours there's some really great resources for students out there in houston and around the country um, and we just need people taking advantage of it so i'll pass the mic to you raj yeah and i think the way i think about it is we have to combine the technology solution which what ali is providing with the human solution which is the momentum piece and let me just give an example here when students get into college in our program we immediately connect them with a young professional mentor in the career field that they want to go into so that mentor who's working at the company who knows the skills those big four that we just discussed can impart that into the student directly they're meeting once a month both of course giving career knowledge how to get into xyz career and transferring the skills that were just mentioned uh, number two, the human piece again, is in-person internships. We know that's so critical for students to get in the door at the companies so that companies can impart XYZ skill that they want in their workforce in advance in a low stakes, low cost way, quite frankly, so that the student is also getting that experience so they can learn about which career field they might need. And I'll just give an example. We have a nice partnership with a company, Accenture, where Accenture provides mentors for students who are interested in kind of that STEM and or consulting area. And then students then have access to an internship through Accenture. Those kind of partnerships between human side, corporate side, technology side, school side, university side, that's what we're doing in Houston, and that's what it's going to take to really close that gap and make sure that the students of tomorrow are actually ready for the jobs we're talking about here. Great. Allie, we talked about these um, in, in one of our phone calls. So many times you hear these are soft skills, but you call it different. Tell them what, what you call it. Um, so I'm mimicking what America Succeeds uses because I think durable skills is so important. We don't just work with early career professionals. We work with older generations as well, um, who all need, no matter where you are in the workforce, to understand these key important skills of how to communicate, how to have that grit and growth mentality, how to show up professionally. And it changes, right? Like, um, 
post COVID as we're on zoom and, and what professional means really continues to evolve. If you understand the why behind it and the impact of your actions, then that is so much stronger than understanding like how to use chat GPT. Right. Uh, and so that the, the durability of these skills is, is what I think makes the most sense in terms of terminology. Okay. So we heard a little bit about collaboration. Um, but I want to hear, how do you see your organizations, your company collaborating with across the spectrum? So with each other, with um, other partners, with educational institutions, and even our public education. Is that something that's underway with your companies and your organizations? Yeah, so I can uh, jump in here. So I want to just share two stats that are really critical, I think, to kind of guiding this. So right now, if you look at low-income students in Texas, low-income we define as receiving free or reduced-price lunch, so let's call it forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year for a family of four, just ballpark here, only 23% of those students are completing post-secondary education. I'm talking four-year, two-year vocational certificate. So out of 100 who start ninth grade, only 23 are finishing. In sharp contrast, 70% of the jobs require education past high school. So we have this significant gap, and we have to collaborate and kind of build almost a pipeline to get students there. And so one of the things we're doing is what we call P-TECH High School. So this is a high school whereby it's co-located at a community college, and students are in a different track depending on what they're interested in. So I'll take an example in Aldean ISD, just north of Houston, there's a high school where there's four career tracks, education, paralegal, cybersecurity, and welding. So the school has partnered with us. We bring in, for example, IBM. So IBM provides mentors, hands-on experiences for the students in high school. Then they get to college. We layer on top the mentor. We layer on top the internships. And so that's an example of an on-the-ground partnership that's actually happening today. Uh, it's just one of many where it's the school district, it's the community college, it's the nonprofit, it's the employer, all working together to make sure that we get that 23% number up so our low-income students are not trapped in that cycle of poverty. Great example. Okay, so now we're going to go on to, to talk more about that pipeline. So at the earlier panel, there was a lot of discussion about diversity in Houston. And so I want to just give you some, some data around that. One out of four um, people living in Houston are born outside of the country. If you talk to our students, 38% identify as Hispanic or Latinx, 32% identify as white, and 16% identify as black. We are one of the youngest cities in the, the country. We're, our average age is 35.3 years. The only city that's um, younger is Salt Lake, but yet we have about 11.2% of our families living in poverty. And so when you've got this low unemployment rate, you've got these great jobs in lots of industries, it really is how do we reach into this population um, differently and making sure that we really are getting the word out about jobs and then recruiting differently. And that could be women in STEM jobs. Um, it could also be just people seeing opportunities because um, the college going rate in our community could be increased. So let's talk about how we're recruiting and bringing people into these jobs. Any one of you jump in. One of the ways that <clears throat> we're recruiting differently is we're acknowledging that um, the teachers have a role uh, in, in high school, and the faculty at the community colleges have a role of understanding our industry, and that just simply saying Enios is hiring is no longer enough. 20, 30 years ago in the energy industry, you popped a job posting out there and you had really great resumes and a lot of the people that, that applied and that you hired were somebody's nephew, brother, uncle, sister, child, things like that. And, and so nowadays we have to look at it as we are, we are selling and we are trying to find buyers. And so we have to go and find uh, the, the future coworkers 
have to fill that pipeline. And so we have to look in areas that we have traditionally not looked because it's not just posting that job anymore. And it is about relationships. And so we build relationships um, in our industry and at Enios with the nine community colleges in the Houston area. We provide mentorships when they have a mentorship program. We sit on their advisory councils. We get to know the faculty. And we, we understand that before we meet those candidates, we need to be vetted <coughs> and build credibility with their um, counselors, their faculty. We go to career days. We, we participate in practice interviews with the students. We help with some of those durable skills where we can. Because while some of those students we're practicing interviews with may not come to work for Enios or may not even come to work in our industry, because of the way Houston is designed, we all need each other to operate our company successfully. So if they go to work for a caterer or a hotel or into the medical center, our employees use those services. We need all of those services. And so we're really having to do uh, a much deeper, deeper dive into some of the organizations, the colleges and the high schools where we recruit from, and not just in Houston, but around the United States. And we'll talk later maybe about kind of what our offer looks like. We've had to change the shape of our offers, and we have to also definitely change, we've changed the shape of our onboarding, and we partner with some of the, the colleges about that onboarding as well and how we onboard uh, our employees. But recruiting is is much more active than it used to be, and <clears throat> then it doesn't stop once they sign on the line or accept the offer. That onboarding is still a part of recruiting them into our culture and our mindset, but also you know, accepting them, kind of like a new son-in-law or a daughter-in-law into your family. You allow them to, and you hope they do, positively impact your culture as well. I very much, since I have one of each of those, have felt that that's the experience of an employee. Spoken from experience. (laughs) (laughs) So one of the things that we do to really impact recruitment and to make it easier for organizations like you is we do a lot of teaching about that first internship. And we help individuals thrive in those recruiting opportunities so that they can get the first internship. We know the first internship or the first job means so much and is the hardest to get. Um, and leads to underemployment if they do not take those first jobs. What I've seen personally over the last four years is that young professionals are way more picky about the internships that they take on, the jobs that they accept, even the volunteer opportunities that they put themselves forward for. They're putting so much pressure on themselves that it has to be like the most perfect internship and that this is the career trajectory that they are on forever. And so what we're trying to do is break that da- break that down, make it feel not quite as scary and overwhelming, and explain the importance of why they need that first internship. I'm just going to read some stats here. Just last week, Strata and Burning Glass came out with a study that 52% of individuals are underemployed after one year of graduation, meaning they take a job that does not require a college degree. After that, if they still have remained underemployed then for the next year, then 45% of them remain underemployed 10 years later. So that means if two years go by and you haven't taken an internship or a job in a field where you can make a um, life-sustaining wage, then, fo- then 10 years later, you're 45% likely to, to still be there, which is terrifying. And that number has gone up. Last year, the number was 48%. And so we're trying to teach these individuals who have been stunted by COVID and who are struggling the skills that they need to be able to thrive in that interview with you because they really don't have the same skills that they had and they don't understand the importance of practicing those skills, of utilizing mentorship, of doing mock interviews, et cetera. So we're trying to do that. One or one thing that we're doing um, to to help with that first internship because we recognize how important it is, is we're actually partnering with an organization for micro internships and for these um, online projects, basically, where you you remember when you were in school and you had like a fake organization that someone made up that you used for case studies. Well, there's businesses out there that actually need interns to do competitive analysis or research for. And so there's marketplaces out there that you can, you can go and, and, universities and and professors can find projects on a platform called Ripen. Well, we're partnering with them to actually bring those partner those micro internships to our students, to our borrowers so that they can have access to these micro like 
you know, eight week projects, but still it's something that's on their inter- on their resume so that when they go interview for a an first internship, they have something there. And it's, it's, we're super excited um, to launch these, these types of innovative partnerships to break down the stigmas and just make it that much easier for students, especially low income students whose parents haven't been there and can walk them through the steps that are needed um, for that first job. And let me make uh, two points real quick uh, that are, I think might be relevant. So the first is, you know, we talk about the diversity in Houston. And one of the biggest things we have to do and we've tried to do is have mentors and role models who look like the students we're serving. Because it's one thing to hear from someone who's been in the industry for 25 years does not share your racial background, your socioeconomic background, your gender background, and that is impactful. And it is critical to have folks who look like you, who you can relate with, who grew up in your community, lived down the street, went to the high school you went to, so you can see yourself getting to that point. And so that's essential whereby companies can help us, you know, putting forth those young associates who are from diverse backgrounds to help serve as mentors. I think the second point is so critical is getting back to high school to make sure students have a plan when they graduate. A plan of, I want to go to X career. I want to go to Y university. Because so much of what we see is students graduate without that vision of what's next. And then they're often either dropping out, not finishing, because there's some level of, I don't know where I'm going to. And so that exposure back in high school through these micro internships, for example, through these exposure opportunities with companies are so critical so that students can say, hey, this is where I want to get to. Now I can work to get to that goal. Great point. A um, couple of follow-ups. Ali and Raj, you both talked about internships and mentoring. Are these paid opportunities for yes, students? It has to be. Yes, 100%. If you can't, if you don't, yes. Okay, great. Well, that's, that, that's outstanding. And then my other question is, do you also go younger than high school? Um, like at San Jacinto College last week, we had about 6,000 sixth graders on campus for Mind Trekkers, which is a STEM carnival, trying to get them exposed to STEM and then how that relates into jobs. Do you guys, do your organizations work younger than that also? In high school? We do not. I would love to, and I see the importance of it, but not at all. Okay. Yeah. We've only gone down a little bit to eighth grade because, and and, and the way we're doing this is, and some of you may be familiar with this, most colleges in the United States offer summer programs aimed at students. Um, A lot of those start in high school, but some do start in middle school. And I'm not so much talking about the summer camps that many of us might be familiar with. I'm talking about these enrichment programs often aimed at low-income, first-generation students of color. Some of those do start back in eighth grade, and so we have tried to expose students to that. Okay. And Stacey, I know your company works a lot with the younger group, so talk about that. But then also, you threw out something that got me, um, that your offers are different. So to first talk about younger groups, and then how are these offers different when you're making deals? Sure, sure. So one of the things that we've um, uh, worked with Greater Houston Partnership through Upskill Houston on is understanding um, at what grade levels it's important to start exposing students to career paths, and, and but don't even use those words. So, for example, uh, I'm working with an organization called Dream It, Do It. It was originally started by the Manufacturing Institute, and then they franchised it off and said uh, we could go on our own. And so we're hosting this summer an energy transition curriculum course, a one-day professional development course hosted at the Federal Reserve, which will be super fun for teachers, and we're going to have 30 third grade teachers come and spend a day at no cost to them or their school district to learn about energy transition, and it's specifically designed curriculum for third grade teachers. The reason we're wanting to do this was to open their eyes to what does energy transition in Houston really mean so that they can work that into their whole curriculum that they're using for all of their students, give them a great fun day out at the Federal Reserve, and and try to influence them. We then participate in Mind Trekkers. We think it's important to try to reach students six to seven times in K through 12 because there are certain points that we've been... Uh, in touch with them for years now in eighth grade. 
we're really not what they want to see in eighth grade. They want to see who they're sitting next to on the school bus, right, in eighth grade. So we work heavily in the high school, heavy in eighth grade, and so we moved into sixth grade. Now we're in third grade. We're going to try to add fourth grade because uh, we need to show them their options. I was in a classroom last week, and I was with seventh graders. I haven't been with seventh graders in a long time. And I asked them, hey, does anybody already know what you want to do later on when you get out of school? And we had a YouTuber shoot his hand up. I'm going to be a YouTuber. I said, oh, I hope you'll come to work for my company. Because we need people to make videos, to show people what's safe, to, show, to teach people. So there's all kinds of ways that people can come to work in an industry like ours. We're a very high-tech industry. So we are trying to spend time with the teachers, with the families, with the students, so that we can learn from them and they can learn from us, and we can share together and build relationship. And then how does our offer look different? So we have fabulous benefits. So for people my age, I want to hear about your retirement planning, your medical, all of the basics. Well, there's another way to talk about that. So what it, how, does, how does any of us want to support your lifestyle? Do you like to travel? You know, what are your hobbies? You might need some medical for some of those hobbies. <laughs> so, so we try to talk to people about how we're going to support your lifestyle with our benefits. How often do you want to change jobs? Do you want to, do you want to move? Those kind of things. Where do, what is your career goal if it wasn't with Enios, how can we support you in that? So we're going to uh, put you on a developmental plan, which is basically we have training. That's what we say. That's what we've said in the past. We offer training. That does not sound exciting to me. We're going to help you develop the skills you need to meet your goals. And some of those goals may also support and be long-term advantages for Enios as well. But if it's not, and we can help launch you off into working for one of our customers or one of our competitors or in a completely different industry, we're going to do that because we don't want people stuck at Enios or in our industry and unhappy and unfulfilled. So we're going to develop you or we're just going to give you training. And so the way we offer it and the way we think about it and package people and engage with our employees on how best to develop you and where can that take you that's a completely, that's a, that's a big 180 on how we think about our relationship with our employees. Great. Okay. So my last question is in two parts, and it really is about, again, growing that talent pipeline, but what excites you most about the future workforce for Houston? And then what's that one note of caution that you want to give us um, as we think about collaborating for the future? So jump in whenever. I can go first. Okay. Um, so, sorry, wait, the first part of the question was what's, what's exciting about Houston's workforce? Yes, what yeah, excites yeah. you about the future right. workforce for Houston? So, um, I, my company's based in Houston, so with that I had the opportunity to work with thousands of students in Houston who were actively looking to better themselves and actively looking to grow their career post-college or post-high school and moving um, into the workforce. Seeing the energy of Houstonians is just it's thrilling. Gen Z, the biggest thing that everyone complains about them is actually their greatest asset, which is that they're entrepreneurial and they're impact driven and they're focused on how can I change the world? And they have the access to the resources at the tip of their fingertips and they actually want to use them. The opportunity or the, the hindrance is sometimes employers don't know what to do with that. They're used to telling millennials or young professionals and early career professionals exactly what to do. And the, and we, we say, yes, we say like, give me more, how much, how, you know, how much more can I, can I take on? And the newest generation is not really taking that same mentality towards it. They're taking this approach of they want to give back to the organization and they want to do it in a way that they know that what they are providing to the organization is actually having a greater impact on the organization. And so by breaking down the tactics of what they're doing and actually explaining the why behind it can really make the biggest difference. And so I think the opportunity for for Houston and my ask is let's give them a chance, guys. Like we need to give them the support that they need. We need to give them that first internship. We need to give them the opportunities so that they can grow and that they can continue thriving in our economy. I also pulled some numbers from the organiz from Ascent of just we've done over a billion dollars worth of loans 
And in that, I wanted to know how much is in Houston, okay? And so 41 million was from career education. So that's like boot camps. So people who are not in a four-year pathway, but have taken out lending specifically focused on a specific technical career and 140 million for um, four-year traditional college experience. That's over 1,200 borrowers in the city of Houston who are actively from low income. So they have a FICO score under 700 and average income under 35,000, 88% are low income, 31% unemployed, who are actively trying to grow themselves and better themselves and likely are not coming from backgrounds where other people have supported them. And so that just shows me like we've got the people in Houston who actively are doing everything that we know Houstonians do best. We're scrappy and we get it done. And so here we've got the next generation that are are raising their hands and saying we want the support, we want the career, we want the college, we want the jobs. And so we just need to to open up our companies and, and give them the, the opportunities. I'm excited about that. Yeah. I'm really <laughs> excited. I think what I'm excited about right now uh, from a hiring manager standpoint is um, – so much. I really like how we, we work into, we're working together in the Houston community. And um, I, there was this acronym that I became aware of a few years ago, but I asked my children because it had the letter F in it, and I wanted to make sure I got it right. So uh, I said, what, what, is, what is FOMO? Is that something I can, like, say out loud, you know, uh, or if I have a shirt, is that okay? And so that, that fear of missing out and I think there is that, you know, I didn't know. I made up all kinds of things what that really could have meant. I was so scared. But, but, but I, I, in this subculture of hiring and growing your company and sustaining your company, what, what I love to find and what I have found, I've only been in this job a little over two years now, is, is there are there are so many opportunities for people to, and companies to collaborate, but we need conveners. So think about it. I, I want to talk to my competitors about this, but I can't because of antitrust. I want to get together with some people, but I don't know where I can meet. But we have Greater Houston Partnership. We have the wonderful college system that convenes us, those of us that want to talk about these folks that have taken these loans out to better their lives, and they want to get a job. How can that happen? And we can just kind of an, almost anonymously say, here's some example interview questions. Let's practice. Here's what's appropriate to ask for in a salary range, things like that. So the books are open. The conversations are open within, you know, the antitrust guidelines, of course. And, and that is just amazing. It, feel, it feels like a lot of us are pulling all in the same direction. And we're working together to, to meet these folks in a way that, that, that will, they can identify, oh, you're here, and I understand your offer. I understand your industry. My, my concern, my caution is, is that this takes time, it takes effort, and it is so different from what we used to do besides just post that job opening. And that we don't understand yet completely once they come on board and they have a talking to, could I see you in my office for a minute? If they're not feeling nervous, then they don't understand what I just said, right? I understand when I get called to the office, could, I, could, could you call me? I need to talk to you, or, or, or if they want to ask for a raise, how do they advocate for themselves? How do they, they take care of themselves from a professional standpoint? What, can, what should they ask for? So we on the hiring side have a lot to learn, and I think the best place to learn that is from the colleges because the, the K through 12 and the higher ed institutions, they are working with these young people before I get to. So what have they learned? And so I follow them around. I'll sign up for anything that Brenda Hellyer's doing because I'm going to learn because they're successful with these people that I want to work with someday. And so I know I've got to make changes because I know they've had to make changes. And so that's a concern I have that the stodgy old in energy industry is not adjusting and adapting quick enough. And so that retention will continue to be a challenge for us. But thankfully, that's very expensive. And if it's expensive, and is it not making us money, we're going to try to solve that problem. So I think that's going to, we're going to get around that. We're going to get around that. Uh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So I, I would say I'm most excited about the collaboration, just to pick up on that. And I want to give a story of one student that I think will illustrate what I'm talking about. 
so we had a student, um, he's given me permission to use his story. His name is Horace, and he grew up in the East End of Houston and came from a low-income family. And he joined our program in high school. And the first experience he had was a volunteer who stood up and said, hey, I will come into the school and do a presentation on my career. That volunteer came in. It happened to be someone who worked at Amazon, told him about their career at Amazon, and he got excited. He got into U of H, and then we had another volunteer raise their hand and say, hey, I'll mentor this student. He then applied for an internship with Amazon, and he got the internship. It was a program specifically for diverse students. And now he's graduated from U of H, working at Amazon, and has gotten his entire family out of poverty. That's possible. Whoop. Oh, thank you. No, 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 that's awesome. And that is possible because we collaborated between the high school, the university, the company, the nonprofit. And so that's what's exciting is this possibility to collaborate. And I think the challenge or the opportunity is everybody has to step up to be in some way, shape, or form helping us with this. Because we can all sit here, but we can only do so much. Every person in this audience can mentor, can volunteer, can host an internship at their company, can commit to sponsoring a student, you know, doing a whole bunch of things, can support what Dr. Hellyer's doing at San Jack. Everybody can do something, and I think that is the opportunity for Houston, is everybody raising their hand and saying, I'm gonna do one thing to help make sure that we get that 23% number, 23% of low-income students who graduate, get that up so that every student can have an experience like Horace did and help get their family out of poverty. Wow, that's pretty impactful. And um, with that, I, I wanna say that, you know, the Houston region, there is a lot of collaboration going on. Greater Houston Partnership has, has pulled together business and industry, the nonprofits, um, but all of us trying to work together through our Upskill Houston project. Um, the panel before, you heard about other economic development groups, and it really has become a very significant regional approach, and that's what it has to be, and I think that's what you heard from this panel. So we're gonna take the next um, few minutes for your questions, and the qu there's a microphone over here, so if you have a question, um, just come forward, and then we'll, you can direct it at one of the panelists. Hopefully, we've got a few. Oh, we do, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. And I, I love hearing the, the varied aspects within the ecosystem. Um, so I really appreciate the way the, this panel was very intentionally constructed. Um, Stacy, you referenced some really interesting examples of how you created more nuanced language around um, the way you advertise jobs or, or benefits and, and how you message it to young adults. Uh, I was wondering, um, for any of the panelists, what have you done to maybe adjust your messaging uh, to recruit those young adults into programs, especially those that may be disconnected from K to 12? And I'm thinking back to the times when we called them, well, my day, it was at-risk youth. Who wants to be in that at-risk youth program? Oh, we can't find them. They're not coming to our program, so we don't know why. And then they became opportunity youth, and obviously this has been a perpetual issue with workforce development programs, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I will, I'll start kind of high level and try to get real specific real quick um, to the, the specifics of your question. So. Um, we've had to do a lot of work on our job postings and the way we think about how we talk about our positions for uh, recruiting in the veteran space. So we have a, I work in a high risk industry, almost as high risk, but not quite as high risk as the military. A lot of outdoor work, kind of like the military. And so you'd think it would be really easy for us to recruit from that that pool of uh, folks that are that are departing the military and it's been a real challenge for a lot of us in our industry and so we've worked with DOD we've worked with a lot of organizations to uh, do a crosswalk as they call it on our, our job posting so we can be translated and so we're now in that process of, of, of retranslating our job descriptions again so they're more attractive to women 
So we're working with the Manufacturing Institute to help us because we've written these job descriptions this way for all these years, and so we sure don't know what different looks like, and so we're getting help to do that. Whenever we want to reach to um, the future um, pipeline of employees, we do that through a very a variety of programs and some of the things that were mentioned today. How do we get involved in mentoring? I currently mentor three 18-year-old first-gen students. Oh, it's so challenging for me. <laughs> But I'm learning to do that. I've had some training. And, and so we, we get into mentoring programs. We get into programs with nonprofits so that we can reach into different organizations with our opportunities. And so it, it takes effort. You have to try. Because your example of an at-risk student, they are not Googling jobs at careers at ENEOS. But we know, because we have access to data, that there are 600,000 underemployed uh, Houstonians in the east side of, of Harris County, and so we need to go figure out where are they and how do we meet with them, and so we go through different programs, so it's nonprofits, it can be through schools, it can be through churches, it's time in the community, so it means we join chambers, we join civic organizations, we, we work on relationship building. And we can't sit back uh, very prideful and say, won't you be lucky to get your job with Enios with no high school education, a great certificate from San Jack, and start at 80000 a year. You're going to be so lucky. That just doesn't work. That worked 10, 15 years ago, potentially, but it doesn't work anymore. We've got to build those relationships. Yeah, so since we're a, a training platform and a software, we have a lot of data, so we can see exactly when students, or who, what we call professionals, fall off. Um, so we do use the word professionals because they are aspiring professionals. They're not students necessarily, they're not learners, but we're treating them the way that we want them to treat us at, in the workforce. Um, and we have worked with, I think, over 100 uh, young professionals to go through the training, give us feedback, uh, and ensure that the language that we're speaking to them is what they want to receive. No video is more than three minutes. It takes about five minutes to go through every experience. As I mentioned, mobile first, very action oriented. And to Raj's point, nobody wants to hear from me. So we have young professionals who have been there, done that recently in the last two to three years, and can talk about their experience with imposter syndrome or their experience of how they worked with their manager to go from that entry-level job or internship into the next role and how they progress through that through 20 seconds because that's all that they need to and want to hear. Um, they can dive in for more if they're interested, but we know that we can't keep their attention for more than seven minutes. And so um, we give them the short snippets in a TikTok style version that they want to see. Still keeping it very professional because again, we're only speaking to them the way that we want them to speak back to us, but in, in a way that they can consume it. I'd say two very brief things. The first is you got to show up to where folks are. So just to give you a very basic example, um, it's going to sound crazy, but in H Houston, we have these new laundromats that are like really almost like a club style, like laundromat where like everybody's got to go in the neighborhood to wash their laundry. We are going to have momentum um, volunteers there passing out information because that's where you got to meet folks in the community where they are about our program. And the second thing is every student in our program when they're in college, receives a scholarship at the end of the year, financial stipend or incentive, which is a gift card, which they can use on whatever. And this is like based on research from across the country that a financial incentive does actually work, even if it's nominal, to encourage folks to stay in a program. So those are two examples. And I'm going to throw in one other thing. So um, at San Jacinto College, we have six school districts that are in our taxing district. And those school districts pay taxes into the college, one of the things we were trying to figure out was how do we make sure that there was an opportunity where every high school graduate saw that they had could come to college at San Jack. Um, luckily, we had started a pilot program called the Promise Program. We got a major donation, and that is now endowed. And so this is a promise for a promise. These students, um, as they're seniors, they pledge, they apply. They have to apply for federal financial aid. We support them through the process. If they're not eligible for, for, for financial aid or if there's any gap, we make up the difference with scholarship dollars from our foundation. And they have three years to complete a credential going full time. Um, that credential can be a certificate. It can be an associate degree. It could be truck driving license. It is to get them so that they see they have the opportunity. 
So this past, last May graduates, we had um, over 3,000 students that are in our Promise program out of that graduating group. 78% of them were first generation to college. So this is how you reach into your community differently. Um, we have about 4,500 um, Promise scholars right now. But that is how we see it as a community. We're going to endow this, um, this scholarship to make sure that it can go on forever. But we just know we have to make sure they see the opportunities. Maybe it's a four-year university they see. But if not, there's other opportunities. And so how do we let them see that it could be anything um, from a certificate to, to so many other options? And that is communicating with those students and their parents early. Go ahead with your next question. Thanks. <clears throat> well, uh, my question is, I think for Raj mainly, but maybe for others, um, with the rise of technology in, you know, let's call it the last like 10 years, but especially like the last five, um, it's made just problem solving really, really easy. Uh, as someone that's, you know, I have, I have a few degrees and um, a lot of what I learned in school is not applicable to my job whatsoever. Um, I'm curious how you guys see education changing or if it will change. Uh, for example, uh, I was just, kind of thinking to myself, like, is there still value in knowing how to write an essay when ChatGPT can do it for you? Is there value in knowing math when you can use a calculator? Um, I think educate, like educators will probably say yes, but for maybe like non-STEM jobs, uh, yeah, I would just love to hear your, your take on if you think like traditional education will change when you don't really have to know how to do it, you just have to know how to use the technology that will do it for you. Yeah, it's a great question. I don't know that I have uh, the answer, but my gut feeling tells me a couple of things. So I used to be a pre-calculus teacher, and I had all my students learn the unit circle, which is like pi over six, the sine is whatever. That makes no sense anymore, given exactly what you just said. So my gut feeling is a couple things should happen. One is um, we should see more education on how to use technology and how to use it as a tool. Um, and so I'm thinking like open book exams, for example, would be like an easy way that you might you know, begin to see this. And then I think the second thing is when we see students who graduate from high school but cannot write an email, they don't know what the difference between 2CC and BCC is, for example. I imagine there would be a lot more of that durable, durable skills, for lack of a better word, being taught. And then the third piece is, and I see, I've seen this at a couple of schools, is actually how can we you know, have more what we call project-based learning? So how can we, while in high school, instead of saying, let's memorize X, Y, Z thing, or let's learn X, Y, Z physics topic, let's build something, let's start an organization, let's solve a problem in the community that's applying our skills, I guess some might call it service learning, if you will, and sort of how can we get into the community and actually put those skills uh, to bear? So there's just a couple of high-level thoughts. I'm sure others have you know, some thoughts as well. I totally agree with everything you just said um, because I fundamentally think, yes, education can, should, and will change, and it'll be so much more about how to how to learn. And that's what college really is, right? Like, you're learning to learn. You're learning to be independent. You're learning how to be, how to independently learn. And if you don't have that desire to learn or that learner vo learning velocity, you will not thrive. And the technology will continue to evolve. And all you have to do as an employer, as an employee, excuse me, is know how to stay up to date with the technology that's coming out and how to actually use it. There was a time that you were not allowed to use calculators. And so there is today a time that you are not allowed to use AI in the classroom. And in 10 years, we will laugh at that and we will say, I can't believe we weren't allowing people to use ChatGPT to write essays, get the baseline that you need to, but then know how to apply it, know how to analyze it, to your point, that's what you need employees to know how to do with the data. I don't care how you get it, but, but learn how to actually use it so that you can make critical decisions and apply that to the, the job or whatever you're needing to apply it to. I feel very strongly about this. And I think you hit it the nail on the head for us. It's that, that critical thinking that goes into it. So I can put a lot of numbers into an Excel spreadsheet, which is, of course, one of my favorite things to do as an engineer. And it will do something. So, so numbers will lie. Numbers will promise you things. Numbers will send you in directions. And sometimes they're right. 
but I've got to have the critical thinking skill to understand where those numbers come from and what do those numbers mean. Now that, that is what's happening with words, right? So you can have an essay written by chat GPT and be full of, of all kinds of quotes that might or might not be applicable, that may be completely out of context. I could have used FOMO completely wrong today. I don't know, Brenda. And so I, you know, so you, but you can't understand that context and vet what you've written or vet your numbers without some knowledge and critical thinking skills or the ability that you've learned to go and how do I check this? That is correct. Don't submit a resume that, to me that ChatGPT wrote without checking it because it's going to have something potentially in there that's not true or it's incorrect or the wrong direction. So that, that means that it's new tools and new tools get added constantly into the education system. And, and just can I add one thing? Oh, please Dr. do. Is that I think education will become significantly more personalized. And so what I'm imagining here is when students are in high school, there will be different tracks, different uh, pathways, self-guided learning, Khan Academy, et cetera, will become much more infused into curriculum. And so you'll be able to sort of, as a student, kind of track which way you want to go. So being the, the CEO of, of a college, this is something we are definitely working on. Um, our, in January, when faculty came back, we had um, somebody come in and talk about AI, what's happening, how it's changing. Then we broke into groups, um, and this was around how do you use this in your classroom? What should you be doing? And as you can imagine, we have early adopters, and we have people say, no way. And, and so, but we, as an institution, have to figure this out. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example. One of my EMT faculty was so glad to have this because what she's doing is her students are, are writing their health care plans for patients and then they're putting it in AI to see what AI said so they then can compare the differences, what's correct, what's not, were there errors, and helping them learn around that. As I talk with um, our petrochemical faculty and the senior vice president leading that, He's telling me all about the AI that's already going on at petrochemical companies. And so how do we use that in our control room to train students around that? English, um, just what you said. How do you personalize those assignments? They can put them into chat GPT. They can, yeah, they're going to get it. But how do you make it more of a personal um, reflection? And then helping them see how they need to go in and edit. I do weekly, bi-weekly updates. I had chat PG chat GPT do one for me okay if I would have sent that out everybody would have thought I was crazy because it was <laughs> and so how do I then take that and make it my own and so I think there's how to, in higher education this is going to evolve and it's it's not easily figured out I think if we don't start building AI into what we're doing we're going to leave our students with g huge gaps and we're not going to be preparing for the workforce and so it is that integration but we do not have it figured out, at least my institution doesn't, but we sure are working hard to, f to try to figure it out. Right now, we're working on a policy on um, AI responsibility and ethical use. We got a lot of our early adopters writing that. We got our non-early -ado adopters, because we need to figure this out. Okay, wow, that was a tough one. All right, let's take our last question. Okay, great. I'm from University of Houston downtown, and I loved everything that you guys are saying. So I've been a microbiology professor, but for the last few years, I started doing high-impact practices, and that's basically what you guys are doing. And, you know, so actually we have a quality enhancement plan coming up that we are trying to propose um, soft skills, but maybe durable skills would be a better way to put it. Um, so a couple of things. One is uh, you were talking about how do you reach out and I think one of the ways that uh, you might want to also think about is reaching out to families because a lot of the Hispanic culture and a lot of other cultures have um, worked with families. If the family wants it, the child will do it. And so actually we have a grant from the Department of Commerce to actually in, to increase connectivity with uh, families and working with the Aldine uh, School District for that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to know from um, Ali and what's from Stacy is how do students know about you? Like, do you work with career offices? Because I would love to have like a video of everything you guys said and present it to people at UHD so they can, book, they can become believers. 
Yeah, so, um, well, on the college side, we work directly with colleges so that colleges can um, both know about our offerings to schools as well as we work with career services departments so that we can help them augment their ser- their services. So um, that that's one way. Another way is we have tons of, like, scholarships and free resources available on our website and social media um, where we give away $80,000. Yep, thank you, um, <laughs> uh, a year just to constantly, like, spread the word and get people aware of the different services that that we provide. Um, I also speak at schools all the time, so I'd be happy to to come speak to your students if that would be helpful. What we do is um, very similar. We work with the colleges and all of the the CTE directors that we can find. So we meet uh, with the Gulf Coast CTE directors, and so those are um, high school um, teachers and, and their supervisors and we um, collaborate with them in large groups and in small groups same thing and figure out which schools align with us in our locations around Texas uh, we meet with them in uh, Fort Worth in July every year and then we meet quarter with the whole state of CTE uh, directors and then we meet with the Gulf Coast folks uh, about once a quarter and then you know, anybody that will listen to us kind of thing. Same here. Yeah, Upskill, upskill uh, creates a, a great um, audience for us all to collaborate with together, uh, those conveners. Economic development organizations are really great to work with as well because they're trying to recruit businesses and attract businesses into your areas, and workforce development comes up. And so they're great to partner with. Um, and so there's a, there's, it's a very large subculture of people around workforce development because it is such a challenge for us. And so I think there's uh, a myriad of ways. Be glad to be in touch with people who are interested in this. If someone says there's, you know, there's no way to get a, an at-risk or a professional uh, interested in something, we have companies that we're doing a three-week internship in cybersecurity uh, with a high school in the third ward in Houston. So there's a lot of innovative, I think that's the word I've been using in this room a lot today, innovative thinking. It's about managing risk for that student, the, the family, the, the company, um, but we're willing to work on it. And we partner with high schools. Students can kind of opt in, and then we also partner directly with uh, colleges as well for students to, students to opt in. So I think you need both, all three of their cards, and I they do. can get involved. And, and your um, president um, is active, involved with all the community colleges, and he's heading up the Houston GPS program, so that would be another way. Right. So um, we are over, and I know you all are wanting to get to the bar, so you won't hurt our feelings if you want to run. But thank you for being here, and I want to thank the panelists. Let's give thank them a round so of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.